will not take terribly long, but we'll see. Um, and then I'll uh, ask about questions at the end. Um, okay, we're recording. And then, okay. Hold on. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> um, as some of you may have heard from me, this is you know, this time of semester is uh, it's defense season for theses and dissertations. Graduate school always sets a deadline like right around the middle. Um, so uh, like uh, October for fall and uh, March for uh, for spring, and uh, uh, so I have four students. It was five, but there are four who are going to finish their master's thesis or doctoral dissertation within the next couple of weeks. I hope, <laughs> and uh, and a word of caution to, as I imagine, probably, probably the majority of you, or maybe all of you, will go down that path because the you know, master's program does have a non-thesis option where you just take more tests. Because who doesn't want that? Um, and uh, um, so, words of the wise, based on the experience of my current students, everything takes longer than you expect. <laughs> so, budget for <laughs> budget for that because otherwise you're just asking to push things off or possibly defer to a later a later semester and it's just unpleasant for everyone concerned, especially the student. Um, so uh, so that's, there's, there's, there's your way in advance warning. OK, now uh, let's see, let's get the screen share going. I think. Uh, I can't tell if it's going. Um, no. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for letting me know. Um, okay. Uh, let's just try that again. It's funny how it works here. Like a, a screen share, it's just like every now and then. It's, it's like a. It's like a lazy employee in a way. Now, now, just be like, no, <laughs> no explanation. Okay, let's. Oh, maybe I have too many things open. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna close some things and see if that helps. Um, uh, okay. Um, OK, and the first thing I want to have up is. Come on, sorry, my computer is being extra butt headed. Um, hello. Don't do this to me. Sorry, I don't know what it's doing. Like it's, it's just flat out not responding to me at all. Um, like I can move my mouse and that's about it. OK, so there's MATLAB. <laughs> um, OK, I'm trying to get some more things closed down that I don't need. Ugh. OK, here we go. I swear to God. OK, can you see the screen now? OK, <laughs> thank yeah. you yeah. for letting me know. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just waiting for a day when the, the whole Internet, all the infrastructure just says, you know what? We're over you people. <laughs> you have worked us enough. Um, go back to the Stone Age and see how you like it. Um, so uh, so here are the two problems that I'm going to step through. And if they deal with uh, uh, Barry-centric 
interpolation. And as a refresher, and I think I have that file here. Okay, so here's what I have. This is from a notes from last week. Um, that interpolating polynomial Pn of x is given by this formula here um, that involves, whoops, okay, <laughs> I clicked on something I really didn't want to click on, but whatever. Okay, the one fat. Okay. Um, stop it. <laughs> okay. Um, this formula right here that involves the um, the x values, the y values, uh, the function of x. And I apologize for the green highlighting. I think I just clicked on something that caused that. Um, and I don't know how to get rid of it. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'm just going to close that file and reopen it. Okay. Okay, this formula here. So, so we need the x values, so x, j, the y values that are y, j. Um, it's a function of x. And these barycentric weights. And... Uh, those are given by uh, this formula here, one over uh, this polynomial at xj, but that's not a very concrete formula. Um, really, it's just, um, okay. Actually, you know what? I don't have that written out here, and I really should have, but um, but I do have it in the book. Okay, so here's the same formula um, that I'm going to implement in this second problem. Using this function, and I'm going to write in the first problem. That's, 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 this first function's job is, here are the x values, only the x values, compute the weights wj. Um, and the formula for that is... right here. Make it a little bigger. Okay, or very big. Um, okay, so so this is what I have to compute for every j going from zero to n. I need to compute this product from a given x values. So that's the first function's job. Um, and then after I do that, stop, stop. Okay, then I'm going to write this function, Lagrange eval. So it takes the x values and y values for the, the data for the interpolating polynomial. And then here's another vector of any old x values of my choosing. So the job of Lagrange eval is to evaluate Pn of x at these x's to produce these y's. And it's supposed to do it using the um, barycentric interpolation uh, formula, uh, this formula here. Now, uh, as I mentioned when I covered this in class, this formula is undefined if I set x equal to any of the x values because we're dividing by zero. But in that case, Pn of x should be equal to the corresponding y value. So in the wording of a problem, you have to take that into account. So here, the last statement, it says the formula is not defined if x equals xi for any i. Make sure a function handles this instead of returning some garbage uh, from dividing by zero. OK. Um, so what I'm going to do uh, for you to see is I'm, so programming live um, to implement these things. OK. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this because this will be this defines the interface to my function. Um, okay, so I need to, I'm on a diary here because I want to run this thing later. Um, okay, so um, Barry waits.
OK. So I'll start my function. And here I'm just copying the input and output from a problem. And before I code anything, I'm going to put in comments here. What is this function supposed to do? Um, so, and what I'd like to do is when I comment these, especially if it's going to be like sent to other people, and I'll post these files in Canvas later, I want to give a description of everything that we see here. What's, you know, what's the function? What does it do? What are the inputs? What are the outputs? Um, you should always start a function with an understanding of what, what those things are. What's the purpose? What's the input? What's the output? So Barry weights, its purpose is to compute Barry-centric weights um, that are given by this formula, and I'll put it in here. Wj is equal to a product. And I'm kind of using quasi-LaTeX notation here. Product from i equals zero to n. Um, I not equal to j. OK. And then I have uh, 1 over um, xi minus xj. You know what? I think I might have that backwards. Let me check. OK, now I have yeah a second way I type it right, xj minus xi. So this product is what I'm computing. So I've taken this formula and literally typed it into my comments. Um, OK. Um, and I'm doing this for j going from 0 to n. All right. If I'm flipping, since I'm going back and forth between windows, if you need me to go back, please tell me. Um, so I'm just going to be like in the zone here, coding and telling you what I'm doing. But uh, since I'm kind of in the zone here, that's things I'm prone to going too fast. So slow me down if you need to. OK, so here I've described what the function is supposed to do. What is my input? Or well, it's only one in this case, x. Um, and that is a um, vector of x values, x0, x1, xn. Now, this notation comes from you know, what's written in the book. But when I go to code it, I'll take into account that MATLAB um, is, uses one-based indexing. Um, but at least you know, I'm using a notation from a problem that I was given. And the output is w, so that is a vector of the barycentric weights. So that'd be uh, w0, w1, up to wn. OK. So now, um, all I need to do is uh, go ahead and code up this formula. <clears throat> now, um, now, how I would normally do this is um, write out comments for what I'm supposed to do. Now, there's not much involved with this function, but I'll do it anyway to show you the process. So, for each one of these j values from 0 to n, um, And I'm going to indent because when you're in a for loop, whatever's inside, you'll indent. So this is what I need to compute. Um, so what I might as well do is have an actual for loop. So j goes from 0 to n. And then I end a loop. So inside is where everything else happens. Okay. <clears throat> now, here, if I go back to the formula in the book, 
I have a product. So I can handle this as a loop. Um, so, um, so what I can do is I can just have a loop that multiplies all these factors uh, together. So, so for that, here we have an implied loop right here. That's also going from zero to n. So now I'm going to refine my comments. So I need this factor over xj minus xi, but I have to take this into account. If i is not equal to j, that's the only time I'm going to do this. And then I have to multiply all these together. So if I, I could compute one factor at a time and include it in my product. So what that suggests is, I could say something like this, wj is equal to itself divided by xj minus xi. So subscripts become um, accessing array elements. but only if i is not equal to j. Now, here's where I have to be careful though about indexing. i and j are going from zero to n, but MATLAB uses one-based indexing. So I'll add one to each index that I have. Now, alternatively, I could have had i and j going from 1 to n plus 1, and then I could use wj and wi without a problem. Um, either or, I, uh, since I'm taking formulas from a book, I'd, 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 I'd like to, this, again, this is a personal preference thing. I'd, I'd like to stick with um, whatever ranges of indices that I, that I have. But I could, I could see going the other way, though. Okay. Um, now, actually, there is a compelling reason to change. So if instead I go from, so what I have here is equivalent to 1 to n plus 1. Here, here, and then I have I and J. Can anyone think of why what I've done here is preferable to what I had before in terms of efficiency? less arithmetic. I was doing all this arithmetic, uh, i plus 1, j plus 1 all over the place. All these, um, they're not floating point operations because i and j are integers, but still it's integer arithmetic. Um, whereas here, um, this, this could be done just once instead of every iteration like I have here. So it's not much savings, but it's something. And they can be the little things like that that make a difference for more complex programs. Okay, now, note, I don't know if you can see, there's a little underline here. MATLAB's giving me a warning. Um, oh, it says that uh, variable W is changing size on every iteration. Consider pre-allocating for speed. But yeah, W is a vector. And I'm filling in W1, W2, W3, and so forth. Every time I do that, if I start a new WJ, it will deallocate the old W and reallocate it at the new size. That's wasteful. So to fix that, I will preallocate W. 
Um, w is the same size as x. They're both uh, vectors of the same length. So I can just do size of x. That way, it doesn't matter whether x is a row vector or a column vector. It'll work either way. And dub, whatever dimensions x has, w will have. Hey, hey, don't drop. Yes. Can I ask, Can I ask one? one? Yep. Um, uh, in your uh, in, uh, statement, yeah. why are we putting W of J divided by instead of one divided by? Um, I mean, I'm sure there's reason. I just want to, okay. for some reason, it's not. Uh, here's why, because um, I am including these factors one at a time. So what's mm -hmm. happening is I, when I go from the first iteration, uh, that actually that reminds me, I do have a missing statement here. Before I start doing this multiplying or dividing, I need to, like here, I've wj is equal to itself divided by something. But the first iteration through, this doesn't have a value at all. I need to give it a value. Set it to 1. So. I start out at one, then each iteration, I will take whatever I have for wj and divide it by a new factor. So in fact, the one that you're looking for, it's right here. That makes sense. Right. Okay, thank you. Yep, okay. All right. Um, and now the function is complete. Um, so all the barycentric weights are, are computed. Um, does anyone have any questions about how that was done? <clears throat> OK. Um, now, now, the way I've written this, um, is it you know, follows the formula very closely. It's just that it's describing its product as an accumulation of factors. And that's something that anytime you have a formula that's a summation or a product, that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be taking whatever value you start out with some in initial value. So it's uh, one for a product or zero for a sum, <clears throat> like from a compute mean example in a tutorial. And then you are tacking on new items like if it's a summation you're adding on new terms if it's a product you're add, adding on new factor or multiplying by new factors and you'll have lots of statements like this anytime you have a summation or product expect to do something like this um okay now um so that's that's a, that's something you can gather from a formula like this one now i'm going to show you a, a an alternative Um, okay, actually, I need to put it down here. That actually doesn't require an explicit loop. Um, so I could say wj is equal to, and I can use the MATLAB function prod. You've seen the MATLAB function sum from the homework. Um, you know, it sums the elements of a vector. Prod multiplies all the elements of a vector. So, I need, uh, so what I can do is I can describe all of these quantities as a vector. And, for, and here's how I can do that. Um, okay. Um, this is going to be kind of freaky just to warn you. Um, so I have one over x j minus x. Now, what do I fill in here? I don't have i. I'm outside this loop. I don't have i. So, but what I want are all elements of x except for x j. And here's how I'm going to do it. 
Um, I'm going to make a variable, I not J. And how, here's how I define it. I not J, I want this to be equal to all the indices that I could put into X, except for J. And here's how I do it. I have a MATLAB as a function called set diff, set difference. And I can fill in the set of indices, one to N plus one. And I want to exclude J. So set diff will take this set and give you all elements of it except what's in here. So here are all the indices except J. So now X of I not J is all of X except for XJ. So now what I have here is a vector consisting of all of these for all I except J. Take one over that because of a formula. This multiplies them all together. So this also computes the barycentric waves. <clears throat> now, I don't care how you do these things. Certainly, you would find this more intuitive. Uh, but I want you to be aware of these um, uh, shortcuts. But dot slash is because this is a vector. You can't divide by a vector normally. If you want to do component-wise division, use the dot. So this takes one over every element of a vector and gives you a new vector of those reciprocals. Um, okay, so that's what these two lines do. So I would do this or this, not both. So whichever one you're going to use, you should comment out the other one. So I'll comment out these. Okay. Now, if I go ahead and run this, as I just realized, actually the function would crash because there's one variable that I've forgotten to define. Can anyone tell me what variable that is that's not been given a value, even though we all know what it means? Is it, is it double? Uh, the W is defined oh, oh, here. Yeah, yeah. What? Repeat, please. I said, I said yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's a different variable. I've, I've not given a value. Was it I not J? Um, no, that was that was. Uh, it was a okay, sign. Okay, sorry. I forgot you commented that out. Anyone else want to see if they can spot it? N. Does not define N. What is N? How would I get it from what? Here's what I. X is all I have coming in. So how would I infer N from X? The length of X minus one. Yes. All right, so I just realized when I was doing all this, like, oops, I forgot to do that. <laughs> so, whoops. Um, okay, now, 
And we use n because that's, that's the maximum value of the index from a formulas as we understood them from a book. However, one could argue that it's kind of silly to take length of x, subtract 1, only to add it back here, especially since this is the only time we're using n for anything. So I'll just remove both. So now n is really the total number of points that you have um, uh, in, in, in the vector. It's not the degree of a polynomial. That's still one less than the length. But since we're working with a number of points that we have, it makes sense to just use that and not be uh, have these superfluous subtractions and additions. OK. Now the function is complete. <laughs> um, so now if I were to run it, uh, so I'll make some x values. Um, so now I'll do uh, Barry weights x. And hopefully I will not embarrass myself by having a bad function here. OK, so it gave me some weights. <laughs> um, um, uh, and this, we see that the weights can be positive or negative. <clears throat> okay. And here I put in a row vector of four elements, and that's what I got as output to. Whereas if I had made x a column vector, this would be a column vector. Okay. So are there any questions about what was done here? Now, um, so that's the first problem. Uh, the second problem is to use those weights to uh, uh, stop, 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 to evaluate this formula when you're given x's and y's. Um, so now I'll uh, write that function. So it's here, uh, Lagrange eval with these inputs and outputs. So I'll create that file. Okay, so this would be my function. Okay. So I'll put some comments in here. Um, so it evaluates. Lagrange interpolating, interpolating polynomial that fits the data from X and Y and is evaluating at, at these values, whatever is in XX. So my input. Um, so the x's are my interpolation points. Y values are uh, values of a polynomial at the interpolation points. So that's x and y are the data I'm fitting. Xx is uh, x values at which to evaluate the interpolating polynomial. And then the output is yy. So these are the values of the interpolating polynomial, pn of x, at xx. So, so we have these ordered pairs, the x and y coming in, ordered pairs xx and yy are coming out, where the xx's are given, and we need to come up with the yy's. <clears throat> okay. And very important, it's using Barycentric formula, which is um, Pn of x is equal to a big old fraction. Uh, so we have a sum. Okay. This formula, so j goes from 0 to n of yj times wj over x minus xj. 
and that's the numerator, and then the denominator is the same, except no y values. All right, so this is what has to be implemented. Okay. Now, um, and the thing is, we have the x's. We have the xj. We have yj. We need these, the barycentric weights. That'd be the first thing we do. So W is uh, will be Barry weights of X. So that takes care of that. Um, if we look at the formulas, we know we we need N. So I'll go ahead and get that. N to be the length of um, X. I'm gonna just use length of X based on the experience of uh, doing that in Barry weights. We know we're gonna have this many terms in the summation here and here. We you know we're going to be accessing these values of x, y, and w from j going from 1 up to this n. Um, so I'm just going to cut to the chase immediately on that based on what we've just seen. But x, this x with no subscript, comes from xx. So I need to iterate over every element of xx. So for each element of xx, evaluate pn of, uh, so each element x, I'll call it x of i, xx of i, I need to evaluate the polynomial there. So that leads me to a for loop. For i going from one to the length, of xx. So here I'll iterate over xx and I will substitute that into this formula. <clears throat> okay. So, so what I can do is since I've been evaluating a summation, I can use the sum function. And what is my result? Yy of i. So xx of i is what's plugged in. Yy of i is the result. So I need my numerator. So that's going to be the sum of um, y times w here I'm using dot multiply because y and w are vectors um, dot divide this x minus xj well x is what I'm plugging in xx of i minus x That's the numerator. So what am I doing? My summation is iterating over all the elements of y, w, and x. So I form this expression from y, w, and x. This x here is independent of j. It's a constant as far as the summation is concerned. And that constant is x, x of i. So this gives me the numerator. And then I divide by this, which would be almost the same. So that would be w dot divide xx of i minus x. And that's it. That's the barycentric formula. All right. <clears throat> Questions about why this works? You know what I just realized? Well, I'm just troubled to find n because I needed it last time. 
Notice it's not needed. Um, if I had done this as explicit for loops to evaluate these summations, then yes, I would need n. But I can use a sum function, and that, and so then it's just going to go over every element of whatever vectors I, whatever vector I give it. But there is one thing I forgot to do, as indicated by this little warning that MATLAB is giving me here. What if I, even though correctness is assured, but for efficiency's sake, there's one thing that MATLAB is telling me to do. And it told me to do it last time also. You have to pre your while. Yes. So. So YY will have the same size as XX. So that takes care of that. And now the warning goes away. But there's still one thing I forgot to do. And that's actually something that was mentioned in the problem that has to be taken into account. So almost everything that I've done here in the problem description has been fulfilled, except one. And what's the one thing I can go wrong with this very centric formula that I used here? One of one the others could be, could be easy. Sorry, uh, repeat. One of the one of the could be zero. Could be easy. Yeah, if I plug in an X, it happens to match one of these X J values. Yeah, it will be dividing by zero. And that's what's mentioning down here. This formula is not defined if x equals xi for any i. Make sure your function handles this properly. Well, right now it doesn't. Fortunately, it's easy to do, easy to take care of. Now, what I could do in this loop is have an if statement. I could, I would have, like, I could um, compare. Have a, a for loop and an if statement that compares x x i to each of the elements of x. And if so, skip doing this. But that actually adds a lot of overhead to do this for every single value in xx. So I'm going to do it, use a different approach that's actually quicker to code, less cumbersome. So what I will do is check if any element of xx equals any element of x. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to have a loop that goes through X. Okay. And here's what I can do. It's rather screwy, but I'll explain it. Okay. Now this is a really odd statement. So let me walk you through it. Um, so I'm using, um, it's called logical indexing, which was discussed in the tutorial. What this expression does is it does a comparison of every element of XX to this number XJ. So that's just a single number. So I get a vector of trues and falses. So true if they're equal, false if they're not. So then, for only those indices for which the element of xx equals this, so in other words, for which the condition is true, I will set yy, my, my output value, equal to the corresponding y value. Why? Because Pn of xj equals yj. That's what the value of the interpolating polynomial is supposed to be. So this has the effect of looking through xx for this x 
And if it finds it, wherever it finds it, it sets yy equal to this y value. So it's basically just enforcing this condition. And it does this for each one of the x values. So no fuss, no muss. So in here, if one of these xx's equals this, yes, there is a division by zero. And some element of this could equal like infinity or not a number, like a indeterminate form. But that's not going to crash your program. I mean, yeah, you will temporarily have a garbage entry in YY that gets fixed down here. So that's one very important thing about floating point arithmetic is that if you perform an operation that doesn't have a sensible result, like you know, dividing by zero, then that's, your program keeps going. Now, you have to do something about it in your results to have them correct, but at least your code doesn't crash. So questions about this rather strange construct. So this is a convenient way to pre perform an operation on selected elements of a vector. Like elements that meet a certain criteria. <clears throat> And that's it. That's the whole function. Done in a very compact way using MATLAB's rather unorthodox syntax. Do you mind? Do you mind? I kind of want a visual of I, like the fitting points. I, I don't know. Um, like, or okay, is it okay. not that simple to plot? Well, I was just going to run this. Oh, okay. Okay. All right, so I need to make up an example. Um, okay, so I have X values already. This is actually an example from a book of this sample data. So, I'll just, so I have four points, so I have a cubic polynomial that fits them. Now, I'm going to set myself up for considerable embarrassment here by using MATLAB's polyfit to generate a true interpolating polynomial just to make sure that mine is correct. You know, that's something I should do anyway, embarrassment or not. Um, now I'm gonna make a vector of X values for plotting. So XX, I'll um, do a, I'll use lint space, giving values from zero to 10. No, um, minus three to three because my X values fall in there. I could have picked anything, but okay. Now, here I'm gonna use it. First, I'm gonna use MATLAB stuff, then I'll use my stuff. So I have the interpolating polynomial. I have my X values. My Y values would be polyval of this polynomial P at, at XX. So now I'll do a plot. And I can use figure one to plot what MATLAB does, and then later I'll use figure two to plot what my code does, and they better match or I'll be upset. But anyway, um, so I want to plot xx and yy. So this will plot the graph of a polynomial on the interval minus three to three. Okay, so there's the graph there. Um, then I also want to plot the actual data. So I'll do X and Y using red circles. Oh, what? Oh, I goofed. What did I forget to do? Hold on. So want to appear in the same graph. Okay, so those are my four points that the polynomial fits. Then we see it grows pretty rapidly outside of that. All right, now that's using MATLAB stuff. Now I want to make sure that if I use my code, it does the same thing. So, um, 
So now do yy is equal to Lagrange eval. Uh, well, I'll call this yy2, so it's a different variable. Um, xy and xx. So it does the work of polyfit and polyval all in one shot. Thank God it didn't crash. So I'll create a new figure window. And um, so plot xx, yy2. All right, they agree, thank goodness. <laughs> um, it's always stressful when I do these code demonstrations live because I can screw up anything. And then, uh, like before, hold on and include the uh, data. Oh, because I put this up, it, I end up plotting these a second time. So I'll get rid of that. Come on. Okay. Okay. So I need to go back to figure two and plot them there. Ah! Sorry, the hold on took effect in that figure also. God, what a mess. Okay. Figure two. Plot the polynomial. Hold on. My apologies. I'm being a schmuck today. Okay. But at least the code is correct. <laughs> Dang it. Um, all right. So be very careful. It's a lesson to you all from my mistakes. When you're plotting things, be very careful as to which figure is active at that moment. Now, when you're writing this, if you're doing pl your plotting code in scripts or functions, it'll handle it for you. But if you're doing all this at the prompt, like here, I had figure two up, but I put this back up. This became the active figure again. So then when I did this hold on, it went into this figure window when I really wanted it to go over here. So that's why I, it turned out the hold on did that, was had to happen over here also. So that's why, uh, again, be very careful as to which figure window is active so that you don't accidentally wipe out something you didn't want to. Okay, so um, all right, I want to check what I have here in my statements. Okay, so these statements that I have here, I want to emphasize these are the correct statements. It's just that in between, I set them up to fail by putting figure one in front again. So if you don't do that, and if you just type these without doing anything else, then it would work. Okay. Um, all right, so what, what, I, what I'm going to do when I post this, I'm going to edit the diary in such a way that um, if you simply do all of these commands right in a row without foolishly clicking on figures as I did here, it will work. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions? About this or the homework? I had, I had one, one about, about 7.23. 7. Uh, okay, 7.23. All right. Here so is. in point 7.2.2, point two point two, I created, or er, during that function, I had a set of Y's that were all zeros except for one one. So my question was, when I call that function, 
when I call make LaGrange during LaGrange fit, will that mess up my Y values? Uh, no, it will not because when you call, and by the way, uh, this is this is for all four of you, LaGrange, not LaGrange. <laughs> Sorry. And you are not the only one, so don't feel bad. Um, so, um, because when you call make LaGrange from within LaGrange fit, um, notice that Y is not passed to it. Uh, so it won't, it won't be affected. Okay. And then my other question was, it was saying consisting of the points which must be distinct. Do we have to, does our code have to check that the points are distinct? No. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you, you can assume that they are. Okay. They, if not, that would be a pain. <laughs> um, oddly enough, uh, the very next topic that I'm covering next week, uh, that assumption is dropped. It will not be distinct. Which does sound kind of odd, but there's actually a good reason for it. Okay. Um, are there any other questions? I just want to double check something yeah. um, on the on the last exploration, which I'm pretty much done with at this point. But so when I'm using the polyfit function to check my work, and Sorry. I check this by paper too. Walker. Uh huh. Which problem, please? Give me a number. Oh, sorry. Um, seven point two point three, or is that what you were just on? Sorry, seven. You said yeah, seven point two point three. Oh, okay. That is the last one. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, I should have clarified. Okay. Um, but anyway, when I'm using the polyfit function to check. I'm getting what I'm supposed to get. Like the columns are adding up to the correct value, at least from like what I've played with on paper. Okay. Um, but I just want to make sure I'm right in understanding that PN of X, the interpolating polynomial, it needs to also be when I'm putting out that output, it needs to be not just the Lagrange itself, but the times the y values oh um yeah because uh well okay your output p is just mm -hmm. gonna be the the, co the coefficients but yeah when you're putting p together um yeah you're multiplying it's it's um where'd it go it's this kind of formula right here okay um, that's what i thought and so i i gotta figure something out in my code because it's somehow it's cur like correctly adding the columns but i guess somehow i'm not displaying it's only displaying the lagrange part of it but not the times the y oh like, yeah. like, like, like if you, i'll figure it out like if you, um So I just wanted to make sure I'm understanding, like hopefully I wasn't like having it right, which I don't think I do, and like banging my head over nothing, but okay, I just wanted to clarify, okay. There's one thing that uh, concerned me a little bit, but maybe I'm making too much of it, but anyway, you, you mentioned something about columns, whereas make Lagrange sets each row of a matrix equal to, um, uh, equal to a Lagrange polynomial coefficients. So I don't know if, if that um, is of significance. Um, I guess I when I'm saying columns, I'm talking about, for example, if I have a polynomial of degree two, I'm adding all my coefficients of my x squared term. Right. Um, OK, yeah. Well, well, yeah, so yes, so, so if you look at, um, yeah, so if you think of the columns of your matrix that comes from make Lagrange, mm -hmm. uh, like each column would be the coefficients of a certain power of X across, uh, 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 across all Lagrange polynomials. Um, let's see. 
Um, okay. Um, Hmm. Oh, well, since you're not, yeah, here you're not really evaluating the, um, uh, um, the Grotter polynomial anyway, but, okay, well, now you have me curious about your code, but, but, is, but, is, <laughs> but is, is it producing a correct polynomial? What'd you say? It is producing a correct polynomial? It's producing the correct polynomial before I multiply it times the y vector. I see. But okay. then it's adding correctly as if I did multiply the y vector in. But I'm not displaying p n of x where I have the y multiplied by. OK, so in other words, because like, the, the way to test this function and maybe mm -hmm. you already is you use the same parameters x and y and call polyfit. Right. right. I am yeah. calling polyfit. And and the reason I'm saying this is I've tested it on paper. So I know what I'm looking for. Okay. And it Yeah, I'm getting Okay. Have you good tested stuff with polyfit? <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, what? I'm getting good stuff with polyfit. Like I'm I'm getting what I'm supposed to get with polyfit. Okay. So but uh, now have you tested have you compared the output of Lagrange fit and polyfit? Have I compared that again? Have, to make sure your function works, you need to compare the output of Lagrange fit and polyfit. Okay. So if those match, you're good. So they should come out with the exact same code. Yes. Lagrange fit and polyfit. So, so Lagrange fit should be one polynomial. Um, yeah, because that's what's returning a p vector of coefficients, same as polyfit does. Okay. okay. In fact, oh, actually, that's the last line of problem. Test your function by comparing your output to that of polyfit. Okay. okay. So maybe, I, yeah, I'm definitely doing something a little wrong. I'll try to figure it out. OK. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> um, so actually, once you have the matrix from make Lagrange, um, and you want to carry out um, this formula, here to assemble Pn of x. Um, now, since there's a summation, of course, that suggests using a loop to do that. Um, it is possible to um, compute the coefficients of P from the coefficients from your ma make Lagrange matrix in a single statement. So for that, you have to put your linear algebra hat on. Um, and uh, see how it can be done that way. I don't care how you do it, um, you know, as long as it produces a correct result. But uh, just something to think about there if you want to do things in a little more of a slick way, um, which is something I personally always try to do just because. But um, OK, so um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, but, but really that's, that's the idea, is that once you, ha you, ha you have a coefficient of these from make Lagrange, um, and uh, then you um, yeah, multiply each one of those, keeping in mind that each row of your Lagrange matrix is one of those polynomials, and then add them up. Um, OK, so uh, but yeah, I, I want all of you to, uh, to test that uh, before you turn in. One of the biggest aggravations when grading MATLAB code is I'll take a look at it. Like, even just looking at the code, like not necessarily running it, I can tell like, oh, they didn't test this at all. Like they didn't run it once. Um, or if they did, it's all going to crash. And they're like, eh, I'm turning it in. Um, so um, I, 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 I do request a, um, 
at least a minimum level of basic testing. At least, you know, if you're going to go to a trouble of running a MATLAB function, at least try it out. And I kind of figured you'd, you, know, you all being uh, such bright grad students, you'd do that anyway. Um, but based on my prior experience, as they say in the South, just saying. Um, okay, they say that outside of the South too, but it seems like more of a South thing. Um, and uh, in some cases, like like this problem here, um, I do explicitly say, ah, stop, stop. I do explicitly say, here's how I'd like you to test it. I know I don't do that in all the problems, uh, but um, if you're not sure, um, you know, what would be a good way to test your function, at least to make sure it seems to be working. Um, you know, certainly, uh, that's something I could discuss um, in class, or you can ask me about it. Um, so, but it's um, when you're building something more significant, like here, like the example I showed today was one in which I write a function and I'm using that within another function. And that's how larger applications start, that you build these little pieces and then you use them uh, elsewhere. And testing those little pieces can be so important because if you have full confidence that those parts are working, but your overall application is not, then you have an idea of where to start looking for a problem. At least there's certain parts of it and you can rule out and say, well, I, it's not there. I know that that part works. Um, and uh, so, because finding bugs in something more substantial is incredibly painful experience. Um, so anything you can do to uh, make that problem smaller um, is good for your sanity. Um, okay. Well, I should mention, since it's on this page right in front of us, I talked about how barycentric interpolation is a fairly new part of numerical analysis and uh, developed by these authors, Barrett and Trefethen. And I actually know Trefethen personally. Um, he, like, like me, he is a got his PhD at, at Stanford, of those uh, well before my time, uh, but I've run into him at conferences and such. So, um, so I just thought I'd do a little name dropping. But, <laughs> um, but it, he's actually a very good writer. He's, he's written some very excellent uh, books on uh, various aspects of numerical analysis, and he's a very lively presenter too. Um, so, okay. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, well, uh, best of luck finishing the homework, and I will come up with new problems to torture you with from, an, from, from the next section. So, okay, and let's see. Looks like I have a lot of things to post. Um, okay, so let me, all right, so off of recording, and off you all go.